All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the final Dharma Doors of 2023. Uh, as usual, I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and that's right, since next Sunday is Christmas Eve and the following Sunday is New Year's Eve, uh, I'm not going to be teaching for the next two weeks on Sunday nights. So I will see you next year, as they say. So I uh, just wanted to kind of say that from the beginning. Um, and we have, a, a, I think, an actually an interesting sutta for the last sutta of the year. When I chose it, I didn't actually think about this being the last Dharma doors. Um, but in retrospect, I'm glad it's a perfect conclusion to a bunch of the suttas that we've been looking at. So that's going to be nice. But before we do that, before we dive into the sutta, I want to kind of, I want to mention something. It's sort of like a a, preli a preliminary remark regarding the sutta. And it's actually a remark that I want to say that pertains to uh, something Lane had mentioned, I think it was last week. And she had said something that I think is important. And it's sort of about uh, and I'm paraphrasing you, Lane, but it was about that these last few suttas that have been dealing with the sense organs, you said something like you want to, makes you want to tear your eyes out. <laughs> yeah. Well, then it's working. <laughs> I'm, we're doing it right. No, but I, I want to mention something about that really quickly. So as you know, we've been reading from the Samyutta Nikaya. And this is, this is a collection, you know, it's a collection of the early teachings of the Buddha or early teachings of Buddhism, but among, among the early teachings of Buddhism, this particular collection is some of the earliest teachings of Buddhism. So I kind of want to make that kind of clear. And something that I've mentioned often in Dharma doors is that early Buddhism is, mm, well, there's something about it. And it's a, it gets different when you get into the more later kind of Mahayana Buddhism. And I want to talk about that sort of at the, I want to leave a little room at the end of tonight to talk about that. But what I want to mention is, is this. So last week, we were talking about gods, right? We were talking about deities and deities and gods in Buddhism. And what we realize is that there are deities and even these godlike figures in Buddhism. But what makes Buddhism so interesting is the gods come to the Buddha to ask questions. So that actually is saying a lot about the status of a Buddha. So I wanted to mention something else in terms of like religion. And so what I want to mention is that there is a kind of a, a tendency or a, there's a way of being religious. And that way of being religious, it is sometimes known as Gnosticism. And that's Gnosticism with a G, G-N-O, so Gnosticism. And that you usually hear this term Gnosticism in regards to Christianity. And you hear about Christian Gnosticism. And that word, by the way, that word Gnosticism comes from this Greek word Gnosis, which means to know. And Gnosticism is this kind of the tradition of knowing. <laughs> well, what, what do we know? Here's the thing. Gnosticism is not a religion. It's a way of being religious. And there's Christian Gnostic traditions, Jewish Gnostic traditions, Islamic Gnostic traditions. There's a lot of different Gnostic traditions. 
the thing that ties them all together is basically to be Gnostic is to basically have a very unfavorable attitude towards the physical world. And the idea is, is that there's, in some traditions, the idea is, is that there's a better place, a better realm, call it heaven, call it the realm of, you know, ideal forms in like a platonic sense. But there's just a certain way of being religious that sort of disparages the world, the physical world, and wants to move away from it. And I'm not the first person at all to say that early Buddhism is a form of Gnosticism. Early Buddhism is very anti-physical world, what we've been experiencing with the six senses that we've been exploring is that Buddhism is pretty like not into the physical body, not into physical stuff. And so the suggestion is, again, just to move away from it. So Lane, in regards to your feeling about what we've been talking about, that's what they want you to feel in that way. Now, I don't particularly want us to feel that way exactly so tonight's a really great night because this is a perfect sutra for like, like, why would I teach this sutra then? Why would I teach a sutra like this if I don't particularly believe in this Gnostic aspect of Buddhism? Well, well, let's read the sutta. Let's talk about the ideas as they're presented. But again, I want to leave room at the end of tonight to discuss the more kind of Mahayana way of looking at this so that we're not left with such uh, a feeling of Gnosticism in that way. So any questions about that, by the way, that kind of anti-world tendency? Yeah, no. I just wonder uh, if there's, uh, I'm trying to think why would agnostic mean what it means given what you just, is it huh. <laughs> etymology <laughs> question? You don't have to go yeah. there. It It is very, very, uh, directly related in that sense. Um, yeah, I can't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go totally into that. Basically what you need to know is that all of these terms are, I guess what you would sort of call pejorative is sort of the word, but like originally people were called Gnostic they themselves did not call themselves Gnostic. Similarly, to call somebody agnostic was, a, um, it was you know, a way of pointing the finger in that sense. You're, you're a non-believer or unbeliever. It has come to mean where people say, no, I'm agnostic. I don't have a definitive opinion about God or what have you, but they comes from this kind of Gnostic agnostic dichotomy. Okay, so let's read the sutta and I'm gonna do the, uh, I'm gonna read it in full and then we'll go back and kind of go through it. So the sutta for tonight is called the Asa Viso Pama Sutta, the simile of the vipers. So it's coming from the Samyutta Nikaya. I'm on page 1237, if you have the wisdom edition. Otherwise, this is going to be sutta number 238 of the section about the six senses. Um, again, this is called the Asavis Opama Sutta. And an up Upama is a simile. And this is the Upama, the simile about Asavisas the vipers. So, bhikkhus, suppose there were four vipers of fierce heat and deadly venom. And suppose there was somebody that would come along 
and they just want to live, not wanting to die, just desiring happiness, being averse to suffering. And people would tell that person, good man, these four vipers are of fierce heat and deadly venom. From time to time, they must be lifted up. From time to time, they must be bathed. From time to time, they must be fed. From time to time, they must be laid down to rest. But if one or another of these vipers ever becomes angry with you, woo, then you will meet death or deadly suffering. Do what you got to do. <laughs> then bhikkhus, afraid of the four vipers of fierce heat and deadly venom, that person would flee in one direction or another. And then people would tell him, good man, five murderous enemies are pursuing you and they're thinking, when we see him, we're going to take his life right on the spot. Do what you got to do. <laughs> then bhikkhus, afraid of the four vipers of fierce heat and deadly venom and of the five murderous enemies, that man would flee in one direction or another. And then they would tell him, good man, a sixth murderer an intimate companion, an old friend of yours is pursuing you with a drawn sword, thinking, when I see him, I'm going to cut his head off right on the spot. Do what you got to do, dude. <laughs> ben Bikus, afraid of the four vipers of fierce heat and deadly venom, and of the five murderous enemies, and of the sixth murderer, that intimate companion with drawn sword, that man would flee in one direction or another. He would see an empty village. Whatever house he enters is void, deserted, empty. Whatever pot he takes up or holds is void, hollow, empty. And they would tell him, good man, just now, village attacking pillagers will raid this empty village. Do what you got to do. Then bhikkhus, afraid of the four vipers of fierce heat and deadly venom, and of the five murderous enemies, and of the sixth murderer, that intimate companion with drawn sword, and of the village attacking pillagers, that man would flee in one direction or another. He would see a great expanse of water whose near shore was dangerous and fearful and whose further shore was safe and free from danger. But there's no ferry boat or bridge for crossing over from the near shore to the far shore. Then that man would think, there is this great expanse of water whose near shore is dangerous and fearful and whose further shore is safe and free from danger, but there's no ferry boat or bridge for crossing over. Let me collect grass, twigs, branches, and foliage and bind them together into a raft so that by means of that raft, making an effort with my hands and feet, I can get safely across to the other shore. Then the man would collect grass, twigs, branches, foliage, and bind them together into a raft, so that by means of that raft, making an effort with his hands and feet, he would get safely across to that far shore. Crossed over, gone beyond, the Brahmin stands on high ground. I've made up this simile, bhikkhus, in order to convey a meaning. This is the meaning here. 
The Four Vipers of Fierce Heat and Deadly Venom. This is a de designation for the four great elements. The earth element, the water element, the heat element, and the air element. The Five Murderous Enemies. This is a designation for the five aggregates subject to clinging. That is, material form, or the aggregate of material form, subject to clinging. The aggregate of sensations, subject to clinging. The aggregate of perception, subject to clinging. The aggregate of volitional habitual formations, subject to clinging. And the aggregate of consciousness, subject to clinging. The sixth murderer, the intimate companion with drawn sword. This is a designation for Nandi Raja, delight and lust. The empty village. This is a designation for the six internal sense bases. If bhikkhus, a wise, competent, intelligent person examines them by way of the eye, they appear void, hollow, and empty. If they examine them by way of the ear, or way by the nose, tongue, body, or by way of the mind, they appear to be void, hollow, and empty. The village attacking pillagers, or dacoits, this is a designation for the six external sense bases. The eye, bhikkhus, is attacked by agreeable and disagreeable forms. The ears are attacked by agreeable and disagreeable sounds. The nose is attacked by agreeable and disagreeable scents. The tongue is attacked by agreeable and disagreeable flavors. The body is attacked by agreeable and disagreeable sensations. And the mind is attacked by agreeable and disagreeable mental phenomena. The great expanse of water. This is a designation for the four floods. The flood of sensuality, the flood of existence, the flood of views, and the flood of ignorance. The near shore, which is dangerous and fearful, this is a designation for personal identity. The further shore, which is safe and free from danger, this is a designation for nirvana. The raft, this is a designation for the Noble Eightfold Path, that is, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right mindfulness, and right concentration, and right effort, and right concentration. Making effort with hands and feet. This is a designation for arousing virya, energy. Crossed over. Gone beyond, the Brahmin standing on high ground, this is a designation for the Arahat. All right, so that's the Sutta. So I want to start by saying that this is, it's another situation where I am so thankful to all of you and so thankful for SFDC and this opportunity, because I've been looking for this sutra for so long. <laughs> and what I mean is, is that this collection of similes, the empty village, the five murderers, these are similes, these are analogies that you hear a lot in Buddhist sutras, but they're always sort of just thrown out there like, you know, the empty village. <laughs> and it's sort of like, and you know, I, I, over the years, I have learned, oh, the empty village, that's the six senses. 
ah, oh, the five murderers, those are the aggregates. But I never knew where, like, what was the source? What was the kind of the original source for these? This sutta appears to be sort of the original source for, at least as far as I can tell so far, for all of these metaphors or similes. So I kind of want to go through them one by one. I want to, you know, discuss their meaning. Uh, primarily, though, I want to discuss the Dharma or the kind of the teaching that's underneath them. So, yeah, so let's just go through them from the top. So the sutta is called the vipers. And that, of course, begins with the four vipers of, uh, what is it? Of fierce heat and deadly venom. <laughs> so if you happen to have the wisdom edition, or I should say, if you happen to have the Bhikkhu, Bhikkhu Bodhi translation, Bhikkhu Bodhi, as usual, has amazing footnotes. And so he has an interesting footnote for the four vipers. And it's about how in the commentarial tradition about this, and I, I like this is what I want to share it with you. It, the commentary tradition says that the four vipers, one of them, basically, if it bites you, you basically break out in like a fever. You kind of overheat. But another of the vipers, if it bites you, you just start kind of oozing, like you kind of just start oozing with pus and it's very eff effluvial, let's put it that way. Another of the vipers, if it bites you, you go stiff as a log. So that's sort of the earth element. And then the fourth of the vipers, if it bites you, it's described as being as if struck by lightning and you basically explode or just disintegrate. And those four venoms, of course, kind of represent the four elements in that way kind of overheating, turning to liquid, um, right? Sort of floating away or being obliterated in that sense. Uh, and then the earth element of going stiff as a board or becoming solid as a rock in that way. So those are the four vipers. They stand for the four elements. So let's remember that in Buddhism, the four elements are physical reality. A feeling, like an emotion, something like love, are those are not considered physical in Buddhism. So we kind of want to keep in mind that in the early Buddhist tradition, and remember that tonight, the first part of tonight, we're dealing with this strictly from an early Buddhist point of view, so from an early point of view, early Buddhism has what is called the mind-body division. In early Buddhism, there is the physical world, which is anything tangible. And that is any, and anything physical is of the four elements. And then there's the mental realm. And mental realm is anything in terms of thought, memory, again, feelings, emotions, all of psychology is considered non-physical. So the first of the Buddhist similes is the four vipers. And, and it's funny, right? Because he says, you know, the way this is phrased is, is basically somebody is handing you these four deadly vipers and telling you, Oh, right. Yeah. And so just from time to time, you're going to just have to pick these vipers up. Oh, yeah. And from time to time, you're going to have to bathe them. From time to time, you're going to have to feed them. And from time to time, you're going to have to put them to bed. Oh, but by the way, if they get just the little least bit angry with you, they're going to bite you and kill you. So that's the Buddha's simile for the physical realm. And let's actually notice that, yeah, the four elements are earth, water, fire, and air, and therefore it's anything, but 
the Buddha seems to be referring to the body made of the four elements. And it's this body of the four elements that you have to get out of bed every day, that you bathe every day, that you feed every day, and that you put to bed every night. And so the Buddha is describing it as if, if somebody said to you, hey, here's these four vipers, they're really angry, and if they bite you, you'll die. Good luck. The Buddha is basically saying you'd want to get as far away from those vipers as possible. And so the teaching is, is that the noble disciple, the bhikkhu, should desire to get as far away from the body as possible. And that's in line with, you know, the teachings that we've been studying lately, or at least that kind of Buddhist, that early Buddhist attitude towards the body in that sense. It's like these four vipers. So, um, and that of course is going to be just sort of the the beginning of this Gnostic attitude I was describing kind of at the opening of tonight, where the Buddha is saying that you should look at the elemental world as if it's poisonous, as if it's poisonous vipers in that way. And you should approach it as such in that way. But of course, that's just the physical aspect of the body. So we, if we just heard that, if the only teaching was elemental, four elements, physical body is like vipers, then we might think, ah, well, then I could drift into the realm of ideas and I could be, you know, a philosopher or I could be a great, you know, thinker where I'm not dealing with the four vipers. I could have an attitude of, you know, bad vipers. <laughs> but still in a way be delighted with the mind. And that brings us to the five murderers. So the next thing that our friend, our poor friend here in the sutta, the next thing that they are confronted with is these five enemies, these five murderous enemies that are pursuing you. <laughs> And they're thinking, wherever we see him, we're going to take his life right on the spot. <laughs> and then we're told at the end of the sutta that the five murderous enemies are the five aggregates. Now, the first aggregate, of course, is the physical body of form. And that's basically the vipers. But the idea is that the other four skandhas, the other four aggregates, perception, conditioning, consciousness, and sensation, sorry about the order. So those are, you know, considered the realm of thought. And of course, you, you know, a sensation, a vedana, we need to keep in mind that, you know, a vedana is about the way you react to things. And what I mean by that is, is that the same stimuli, the same flavor, you might not like it, and I might like it. Therefore, we are having two different Vedana, two different senses of it. But we want to notice that that sensing is a very mental preference in that way. We are not talking about the physical reality of what's going on in the taste buds we're talking about the sensorial reaction to it that's in the mind along with perception conditioning and consciousness so you know a couple of weeks or a few months ago we were dealing with all of these suttas talking about the five aggregates so we don't need to go deep into the five aggregates but let's think for a moment Let's take a moment to think about this idea of approaching the five aggregates as five murderous enemies that are chasing after you, thinking as soon as we see them, wherever we see them, we're going to get them. Well, that's that 
further attitude that we've been discussing towards the skandhas, towards the body in that way, and that the noble disciple, the bhikkhu, basically looks at the five aggregates as they are these dangerous people, and so wants to get as far away from them as possible, not have anything to do with them in that way. That totally, of course, is what we discussed when we were doing the skandhas, the different sutras on the skandhas. So that kind of adds up. I did want to mention something. Actually, I'll hold off on that till we get to the, the six senses. Let's do the next one, though. So in this sutta, the Buddha adds on this sixth murderer. And this sixth murderer is a, quote, intimate companion who is also pursuing you with a drawn sword, thinking that wherever I see them, I'm going to cut their head off right on the spot. And then later, the Buddha tells us that this sixth murderer, who's a, a close companion, that that is this Nandiraja. So Raga or Nandi Raga. Raga, of course, is that attraction, that stimulation that we've talked about. It's one of the poisons. It's one of the afflictions, right? But this is a kind of a compound term. Nandi Raga, the sort of the desire for pleasure in that way. Nandi, Nanda is pleasure. So... This is this sort of, ah, and I wanted to mention this idea of the, the intimate companion. So if you read Bhikkhu Bodhi's notes, his footnotes on this one, there's a commentarial tradition, and the commentary talks about how the five aggregates, who are the five like enemies, these are like, the 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 feeling about these five enemies is that they're like chasing after you and so you want you, you're like running away from them in that sense but the idea of this sixth murderer who's an intimate companion the idea of this sixth one is this this sixth one you would you wouldn't know that this was an enemy you, you would think that they were your best friend in that way. And if you start thinking about that regarding the pursuit of pleasure, the desire for pleasure in that sense, that's, you know, a very subtle, you know, Buddhist way of noticing that. Take, for example, let's go kind of go back quickly to the five enemies of the aggregates. If If you've ever sort of like, suffered. And what I mean by that is if you've ever had any physical ailments or mental ailments or just sort of problems with the skandhas, <laughs> there's a way in which if you've suffered, you probably have had the experience of wanting to get away from your own body, either because your own body was hurting too bad, or you might have even wanted to get out of your own mind because you're, maybe your mind was obsessing about something. But my point is, is that we have experiences of the body or of the aggregates that give us reason to not cling to it. Or to use the Buddhist language, the body often gives us reason to not rely upon it in that way. And that's what the Buddha is often talking about. And if you remember from the last, the last couple of suttas where we've been talking about the six senses, you might remember that there's a, re a refrain or like a, a thing that keeps coming up. And the Buddha says this, hey, bhikkhus, are the sense organs permanent or impermanent? And the bhikkhus say impermanent. And he says, right. And is what is impermanent, 
great and wonderful or suffering? And the bhikkhus go, well, what is impermanent is suffering. And then he says, right. And so is that which is impermanent or suffering, should a noble disciple call that self? And the bhikkhus go, no, world honored one. And that's the, the kind of the essence of the teaching, which is if it's impermanent and suffering, don't cling to it as self. So once again, the idea is, is that the five aggregates, the body in that way, it often gives us plenty of reason to not rely upon it, to not, you know, get attached to it in that way. But pleasure, pleasure is tricky. Pleasure rarely ever gives you reason to abandon it. If you know what I mean, it's pleasurable. When was, you know, when was the last time you were in the middle of something pleasurable and you were like, okay, done with that? Like, and just stopped it because you, I'm not saying it can't happen. But the point is, is that we don't really have a reason to mistrust pleasure, in particular, the desire for pleasure, the nandi radga. We, we don't really have a reason to not trust that unless we have done some thinking about it. And when I say do some thinking about it, I mean it from a Buddhist point of view, where we've looked at the ephemeral fleeting nature of pleasure. We've looked at the relative nature of pleasure, that pleasure is sort of relative to pain in that sense. For example, there's a kind of a classic um, uh, it's more of a Western, eth like if you study philosophy and ethics in the Western tradition, an example that's often used is this. If every day I came over to your house with a giant four by four, so a giant uh, piece of wood that's four inches by four inches, and I just hit you with it every day. And then one day I showed up with a, a little two by four or even like a two by two. And I hit you with that. You might barely feel it. And the idea is, is that there's a, a relativity to pleasure and pain, which is that if you've been used to being hit by a four by four your whole life and somebody hits you with a two by two, it could be pleasurable relative to what, you you know what was worse and so the buddha or buddhism it looks at pleasure in that way and notices that pleasure is actually very relative to a certain kind of understanding of what pain would be in that sense same thing happens all you know there's many many examples of this in terms of the relativity of pleasure in that sense my point, though, is that there, there's a reason why I think the, the Buddha describes the desire for pleasure as this kind of intimate companion that you wouldn't otherwise be suspicious of. But he's suggesting, no, 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 this companion has it out for you in that way. So, all right. Any questions about the simile so far? The four vipers, five skandhas, or the sixth? one of pursuit of pleasure. All right. Next up, the empty village. So the Buddha says that this, so this poor person, right? These vipers are chasing them. These five enemies are chasing them. This old friend of theirs that they thought they could trust with the sixth one is chasing them. And so imagine right that you're like being pursued by all this these you know people coming to get you and you think ah oh, look a village i'll be safe there'll be people there ah but alas <laughs> it's an empty village and so um that person being pursued by all these things would see an empty village 
But whatever house they enter is void, hollow, and empty. Whatever pot or whatever, basically whatever they pick up is also void, hollow, and empty. And then in addition to that, there's these people going to come attack the village. But let's not rush past the empty village. So the Buddha says that the empty village is the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the brain, the mental faculty. So the six sense bases. This, of course, the empty village of the six sense bases, that's why this sutta is in this section. Because let's remember that we're reading all the suttas about the six senses. So that's how this one slips in there. But what's the message here? Well, the first message, the main message, there's nobody home. But let's look at that from a kind of a dharmic perspective. They're talking about how there's an aggregation here of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mental faculty or brain. I think that there's a Michael in there somewhere. <laughs> Do I still think there's a Michael in there somewhere? Maybe not. But the idea is, is that insofar as I have a self-identity in that sense, then I think there's somebody home. <laughs> I think there's somebody living in the village. So the metaphor or the simile of the empty village is about how in the village of the senses, there's nobody there. So it's kind of, a, I find it one of the more subtle of the similes for no self, the empty village where nobody's home. But then we also want to notice this, that in this empty village, all the houses are void, hollow, and empty. And then anything that we find in the village is also void, hollow, and empty. Now, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, you know that we, a long time ago, or not too long ago, but a while ago, we were dealing way more with the teaching of emptiness because we were reading more uh, like Prajna Paramita Sutras and more Mahayana Sutras that talk about shunyata, emptiness. And whenever we get to talking about emptiness, we do need to acknowledge that the idea of emptiness is present in the early Buddhist tradition, but it doesn't quite have the, the philosophical meaning that it does in the more post-Nagarjuna Mahayana Buddhist tradition. What I mean is, is that even though it does sound like the Buddha's talking about the emptiness of the village, and that you would almost want to say, wow, this is like early Prajna Paramita emptiness talk. Maybe, maybe not. We, it, you know, when the Buddha uses terms like hollow, it it's tricky because hollow has a certain connotation that doesn't pertain to emptiness as in shunyata. So in this sutra, it would seem to be pointing more towards anatta or anatman, no self, not so much the grand emptiness. But I bet a, an argument could probably be made though, that the Buddha is talking about the actual shunyata or emptiness of these things. Okay, so that's the six senses, the empty village. Any questions about that? Again, we've been talking about the six senses for a while, so. All right. So then right in there with the empty village, so our, our, our poor person, chased by the ven venomous vipers, chased by the murderers. They think they're going to get to safety in this village. 
Turns out the village is empty. Nobody's home. And then they are told, dude, <laughs> the village attacking uh, decoits. I don't know why they're using a, such a specific term as a decoit, but basically like looters, pillagers. So people tell them, village attacking pillagers are coming to raid the empty village. Do what you got to do. So then the Buddha tells us at the end of the sutta that the village attacking dequates or the village attacking pillagers are the six sense objects. And then he says this idea that the eye, bhikkhus, is attacked by agreeable and disagreeable visible forms. The ears are attacked, the nose, the tongue, the body, eventually the mind is attacked by agreeable and disagreeable things. So this is also sort of what I was getting at at the beginning of the talk tonight, where this type of Buddhism is very anti-world. And that ultimately for a noble disciple of this tradition, the attitude that they should be developing towards the things of the world is that they are trying to attack you. <laughs> They're attacking your eyes, your ears, your nose, your tongue, your body, and your mind. And I want to emphasize it again. It's not just the bad things that are attacking you. It's the good things, the agreeable things too. Now, again, I'm, I want to make sure to leave that time at the end of tonight to like even this out a little bit. But while we're still talking about like the early Buddhist tradition that is more Gnostic in that way, I just want us to think for a moment. I want us to notice that if this were the attitude and in particular, I want to focus on the twofold, the twofold attitude of one, nobody's home, nobody's in the village. And then two, the attitude that all of this sensory business is attacking you or attacking in that way. I want us to notice that there would be sort of like, Get given given those parameters, there's sort of like one movement that makes total sense, and it's meditation. Meaning, oh, okay, so if all of these visible forms are really kind of attacking me, and I, I've used this example before, I've used this example often in the past, I haven't used it so much, but I'll use it because I just uh, the other night, it, it, I was in such a situation. So I used to use the example a lot of going to um, sports bars where there's like an inordinate amount of television screens. <laughs> so not just like one, but many, many, many. <laughs> and whenever I go to those places, which again, the other night I was in one, I feel attacked. I can't, I, it's like sensory overload in that way. But I mean, I don't, I don't mind a little television, <laughs> but at, at that level, at that amount, it's sort of attacking or it can feel attacking. And, you know, there's a way of, of course, where certain loud noises or certain things can feel attacking. And my point is, is that if you were to have that kind of general attitude, not just towards sports bars, but towards just visual phenomena, yeah, you might want to close your eyes. <laughs> and if you really kind of have that attitude towards sounds, you might really enjoy a very, very quiet meditation hall. And if you really have that attitude towards flavors, you might be like the early Buddhist that just went around begging for the minimal amount of food to survive and basically ate it as quickly as possible to be done with it. So my point is, is that early Buddhism, the lifestyle 
of deep meditation, kind of austerity towards flavors and smells and all of that. It lines up with this view of the world. Again, what tonight we're kind of calling the Gnostic view of the world. It, it adds up. So again, I'm not exactly like, like extolling that path, but we're talking about it at least for right now. So, all right. We're getting close. To, we're getting close to the end. We have one kind of one more problem area, and that is the great expanse of water. So the Buddha also says in the analogy that now that the now that our poor person gets to the empty village, but nobody's home, then finds out that there's just a bunch of attackers coming, six attackers coming to get the, the village. We run away only to come to this great expanse of water that is separating this shore from the far shore where it's all safe. If only we could get over there. And the Buddha tells us that this great expanse of water that is separating us from the, the, the green pastures of Nirvana over there, the, the flood or the water that's separating us are the four floods. The four floods of sensuality, comma. It, uh, let me use the language that they use first. So they use the flood or the waters of sensuality, existence, views, and the flood of ignorance. So let's remember that we that the Buddha is speaking analogously, speaking in similes. And so the simile is that the physical aspect of the body, the four vipers of the elements, are attacking. The skandhas are binding us and attacking. The desire for pleasure is attacking us. The senses are attacking us. The sense objects are attacking us. All of this. And there's hope. There's freedom. There's liberation. But there's something in our way. And what's in our way from being liberated from all this suffering are these four floods of this, this great expanse of water. And the first of those is sensual desire, all right? And of course, that shouldn't be a huge surprise to us, especially if we've been studying early Buddhism or any kind of Buddhism. So the first of the floods that is keeping us sort of on this side of things, on this shore of suffering, the first is sensuality. The second is bhava. Now, bhava is a very tricky word, but for now, it is basically, yeah, existing, life. And I know this is going to sound, uh, it's going to sound intense, but again, we're here to talk about the early Buddhist kind of view in that sense, where I probably should choose my words carefully in terms of what's coming next, but the kind of the Buddhist attitude in that sense. Sensuality is a problem. And basically, wanting to live is a problem. I'm not advocating this early Buddhist view, by the way. I just want us to notice something. I And I want to put it to you this way. I want just... Notice this. Just think about it. I was thinking about somebody earlier who is afraid of flying. And they had to take a flight soon. And they were a wreck. They were crying. They were shaking. They were so nervous. So, so nervous about flying. But why would you be afraid of flying? I, 
I ask rhetorically, of course. I know why. I know why I'm afraid of flying. I know why anybody who's afraid of flying, I bet it's not because you don't like clouds. That's probably not why you don't like flying. You probably don't like flying because of the potential risk of dying. Now, what I want to be really, 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 really uber, uber clear about this. I want us to notice that, let's say I have plane tickets. It, what I mean is, is that I've already made the decision that I'm going to fly. I, let's look at the fear. Let's look at the nervousness. Let's look at all of that and ask ourselves, where's that coming from? It's coming from this second flood, this flood of existence in that way. Now, what I want us to think about is I want us to think about like, it's, it's, I want us to think about this kind of very, I would consider it a Buddhist perspective. And what it is, is, is this, let's see how, actually, how could I put this simply? Well, one of the ways that I could put it simply, I've shared, I've shared this with, with Dharma doors. I've shared this in Dharma doors before, but I sort of have a, a, a mantra and I don't mean like a Sanskrit word. Uh, I have a motto. I should use my language better. I have a motto that I sort of try to live by. And my motto is about trying not to let death win twice. And the point is, is that this idea of mortality is, it does seem inevitable. <laughs> and therefore that sense of dying, death's gonna win then. But every moment I sit here worrying about it and fearing it, I have basically kind of died twice. Now when I'm worrying about it, and then when it's really going to happen, why not just wait until when it really happens? And then worry, <laughs> worry all you want then. But until then, <laughs> and so my point is regarding this kind of fear of flying Maybe, maybe, maybe when the captain comes on and says, folks, I've got bad news for you, you know, okay, fine, then worry if you must, but don't worry weeks before the flight. Like we need to an an analyze like where that's coming from. And what I mean by that is, is this, you can look at it really, really simply. Let's say I was the type of person who had a deep fear of flying. And in a couple of weeks, I was, I had a flight. And so I'm sitting here and I'm just so nervous about it. If somebody came up to me and said, you know, well, you know, why are you so nervous? If I were to say, well, I, I might die. And then they would say to me, well, then, you know, what's the problem with that? And then the answer would be, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. My friend could tell me, but you're here now then. So you should be happy. Why are you not happy? <laughs> you notice the problem there? You're saying that you're so sad and afraid about not being but you're missing the fact then that but you are then presently being now. So you should be really excited and happy, not fearful. But notice the problem there that the fear sets in or the second flood of existence sets in. And so I hope I've done a kind of fairly decent job of explaining how you can kind of not cling so desperately to life, but this is not nihilism. This is not, you know, not caring about it. It's just actually being kind of rational and clear about it, if that makes sense. All right, so the things 
the four things keeping us from that far shore of nirvana are sensuality, desire for existence in that sense, views is the third, drishtis. We've done a lot of talk about drishtis, and I actually think next year I'm going to get into sutras that are about drishtis. So I'm not going to talk too much about views, but we kind of probably want to think for a moment about how views, in particular, when we're talking about Buddhism, we're always sort of interested in what is called the view of a self. And the Buddha is, of course, talking about how that very view of there being a self is one of the things keeping us on this shore, along with sensuality and the desire for existence. And then, of course, the final fourth flood or fourth thing that's keeping us on this shore, ignorance. We don't know what's causing the suffering. We don't know about clinging. We don't know about all of these things. And so we're just over here on the shore that the Buddha says is samsara, just cycling around in that way. So those are the four floods that are separating this shore from the other shore. And the Buddha says that, quote, this shore, this side of things, is Sakkaya. Sakkaya is a, it's a word. I don't use that word a lot because it doesn't come up too much in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. It's kind of a term you see a lot in the more Pali Theravada tradition. But Sakkaya is, it's a type of self-identity or personality identity. We've talked about an idea or a personality identity called a Pudgala or the Pudgala. But the personal identity known as a Pudgala is actually more about clinging to an identity, but by which we mean like a personality, like, oh, like you're such a funny guy, or you're, you know, this type of person. That's a Pudgala or a Pudgala that can be identified with and, and we can cling to it as self. But there's another kind of personal identity and it's about the kaya. And this is so the sakkaya is the idea of the true body. And it's about basically identifying with the physical body, not like personality traits in that way. Either way, it's ultimately a kind of a designation for the selfing, for Atman or Atta. So that's this shore, or that's what the Buddha describes as this shore. The farther shore, which is safe and free from danger, that's Nirvana. Now, the thing I want to mention about the far shore the other shore and the idea of nirvana as the other shore. Well, there's a word for other shore. <laughs> and the word in Buddhism, it's a Sanskrit word or Pali word for the other shore is paramita. A paramita is the other shore. And so actually, whenever we're talking about the paramitas, like giving, moral discipline, patience, energy, meditation, and wisdom, the reason why they, those are called paramitas or other shores is because those are things that get you to the other shore. So that whole analogy or simile of the other shore and, and getting from this shore of personal identity to the far shore of nirvana, that all of that metaphor 
is coming ultimately in a way from this sutta or this kind of whole family of similes that begins with running away from the vipers, running away from the all of them, and then finally getting to this other shore or this shore, the expanse of water, seeing the far shore of Nirvana. But how do we get there? There's no ferry. There's no bridge. How do we cross over? Well, we build a raft. And the raft is a designation for the Noble Eightfold Path. Right? So right view, of course, we have to have the right view because the view is part of the problem that's keeping us on this shore. It's one of the four floods. So right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right samadhi concentration. The Eightfold Path is our raft. It's the raft that we've pieced together from branches and leaves, meaning from right view, right intention, right speech. We've put together this raft and then the Buddha says we need to put forth effort, the making of effort with our hands and feet. We're going to paddle over on our raft to the other side. The paddling over, the making of effort is virya. And virya is one of the paramitas. So it's all clicking together. And then we get our final aspect of the analogy crossing over, gone beyond, the Brahmin standing on high ground. That's a designation for the Arahat. So that whole, this whole sutta is a beautiful description of the path. All the way from becoming disillusioned with the physical world becoming disillusioned with the mental world, seeking escape. Here's the means to get out of it. And this is what happens. And then we get to this going beyond. Really quickly about the raft. I want you to know, well, so in another collection of early suttas, the connection, the, um, the middle length discourses, the Majjhima Nikaya, there's a, sutra, a sutta in there called the raft. And it's a pretty famous sutta because it's the famous sutta about the raft. And basically it's, it's basically the part of this sutra that's about the shore getting to the other shore, but there's no ferry and there's no bridge. So we build a raft. What is, what's interesting though is I've I've you know I've read that sutra about the raft since graduate school because it's, it's a very famous sutra. But what's unfortunate about that version is it doesn't give you this great backstory about why we would even want to get across exactly. Like this whole idea of being chased and getting to the water and there not being a bridge, so we build a raft. There's a whole kind of narrative to it all. Except there's one part of the, the raft sutra that's in the Majjhima Nikaya. There's one part of that that's not in this sutta. And it's why that other raft sutra is so famous. It's because in that sutra, the Buddha basically talks about the raft as just being something to get you from one shore to the other. And it's in that sutra where the Buddha says, once you're on the other shore, you can let go of the raft. Now, if we understand that the raft is the Noble Eightfold Path, which is basically a synonym for Buddhism, then it's saying that once you're on the other shore, you can let go of Buddhism in that way. And that's very much in keeping with the teaching of non-attachment. 
And what I mean by that is it's a really kind of profound level of wisdom to say, oh yeah, and even this, this teaching that's going to get you to not cling, you can't cling to that either. So that, that aspect of the raft sutra, that little piece of the raft, which is not holding on to the raft, that becomes a very, very important part of the famous Vajra Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra. So the Diamond Sutra is, I, I don't want to say it's about that parable of the raft, but it is a big chunk of the Vajra Sutra is understanding that parable of the raft. So, all right. Ah, so what I'm kind of doing by introducing the Vajra Sutra is I am starting to bring in the Mahayana. And I did, I left, I did it. I finally did. I left some room because I do want to talk about the, the Mahayana approach to all of this. So basically, the way that I could probably summarize this the most kind of succinctly. So the early form of Buddhism, as we've been describing, is pretty Gnostic in its view of the world. It's uh, pretty austere in terms of its practices, right? You know, eating one meal a day, no hair, all of that. So what eventually happens is, is Buddhism, you know, starts to grow and develop. And at some point, and, you know, whether this was the Buddha or somebody like Nagarjuna or whoever, it doesn't really matter, I think. But what we do know is that we don't know who or why or when, but at some point, Buddhism sort of, I don't want to say splits, but up in the northern regions of India, near today what is Pakistan, Afghanistan, there was one type of Buddhism that became very, very popular. So popular, in fact, it spread outside of India went to China, went to Japan, went to Mongolia, went to Tibet, and basically all forms of Buddhism today, except for one little pocket, is all Mahayana Buddhism. And that type of Buddhism did this. So, in the early form of Buddhism, the Buddha recognized that our suffering or a lot of our suffering, it came from a mind that kind of privileges things. And basically a mind that, you know, wants pleasure, but not pain, wants gain, but not loss wants this, but doesn't want that. So, you know, you could call this kind of dualistic in a sense, but it's an idea about kind of actually, especially when we take into consideration the flood of views, that was one of the four floods is like all these views. Well, the idea is, is that all of those views which are putting these things above other things and privileging things, all of that is causing suffering, the Buddha says. Well, at a certain point in the history of Buddhism, they recognized that we were putting down samsara and lifting up nirvana, meaning we were privileging the other shore. And we were putting down this shore. So even though we had sort of transcended the world, we hadn't actually transcended the duality of making 
distinctions and privileging things over other things. And so that's where, again, maybe it was the Buddha, maybe it was Nagarjuna, but the Mahayana says, samsara is nirvana. Nirvana is samsara. And at that point, there's nowhere to go. And my point is, is that the Mahayana is interested in that truly transcending, truly going beyond. And that a truly going beyond does not think that beyond is over there or over there. Marnie, you have a, a comment or a question? Um, I think you're actually getting to the answer of my question. And that was that, you know, in all of these situations, um, we're running from uh, these basic things. And a few of them I want to flesh out a little more, please. Um, the, you know, one, why would we run from the elements? I don't understand that when we're made up of those. Uh, and then the rest of them, as they kind of go through this, these are things that basically the you know, Eightfold Path um, allows us to deal with, essentially. And that's why I didn't understand throughout this that we're, all, we're running you know, to the shore to get away from it, when ultimately the, the means, I guess, the skill and the means come from you know, the Eightfold Path, right? And, um, I guess that's where I'll leave it for now because I think that's where you're headed with your answer, perhaps. It was, Marnie, absolutely. But I'm actually very happy for your comment slash question in that way because you're told it was right there in the sutta. And I didn't actually pick up on it in that way. The idea of running away, you're totally right, Marnie. And in fact, in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, what they talk about in terms of the bodhisattva, what makes the bodhisattva different than the practitioners of the little vehicle, what it says is, is the little vehicle, they're afraid of samsara. They're afraid of it. The bodhisattva isn't afraid of anything. And that's what allows the bodhisattva to approach samsara as if it's nirvana. Or, and now this is the interesting aspect, or approach nirvana as samsara. Now, what would we mean by that? Well, if you are creating a duality, which says samsara is bad, nirvana is good, if you're doing that, then nirvana is samsara. Because you've dualized it into this ridiculous uh, paradigm in that way. So the bodhisattva is in that mode of like, and this is why, by the way, for me, it's not that Buddhism splits into these two traditions. It's that there seems to be a Buddhist tradition. And then there's a group that the Mahayana that actually wants to get back to what the Buddha was talking about. And all of this more Hinayana discourse that's very dualistic, that's very samsara bad, nirvana good, that duality does not end with just the samsara nirvana thing. As, as you all probably know, because I talk about it a lot in Dharma doors, the earlier kind of Buddhist tradition, that Hinayana tradition, it's very dualistic. And the main place where it's dualistic that I really am not on board with is its duality around sexes and, and the genders in terms of that it's a boys club kind of a thing and the, the, the ladies have to wait until their next life. That's like the most <laughs> dualistic, non-dharmically sensical thing to me, but it makes sense in the, in, in what I mean by that is 
that Hinayana tradition became very dualistic in a lot of different ways. And I think that that dualistic attitude is what allowed for the boys to split off from the women in that way. Whereas in the Mahayana tradition, there's no particular distinctions in that way. There's distinctions between bodhisattvas and not bodhisattvas, but anybody can be a bodhisattva. It just takes making the bodhisattva vow in that way. So, yeah. So, Marnie, you nailed it. You hit it right on, you hit the nail right on the head that the whole kind of attitude of running away in this is what the Mahayana considers the problem. Now, because we're not dealing with a Mahayana Sutra tonight, I do kind of want to swing back around though. And, you know, I don't want to throw this out completely. So Marnie, your comment about uh, the four elements and this idea of, but we're made up of the four elements. We are. And that's a big part of Buddhism is recognizing that, that this is that, that this is a bunch of elements and particles. That's a bunch of elements and particles. There's no difference. It would be much more of a Mahayana Bodhisattva path to just see there being no difference between these particles and those particles. I agree that the attitude would not be one of negativity, more of just neutrality in that way. But let's not lose sight of the Dharma. Like, let's not lose sight of the teaching. And what I mean is, the Buddha is talking about the way in which we, um, what's, you know, there's an expression in English about like putting lipstick on a pig, I think. But it's about sort of, there's one way of, of, there's one way of approaching the elements, the four elements. And that one way would be that they are great, wonderful, sources of great pleasure and delight. All your wildest dreams can be fulfilled with the four elements. That idea that the four elements are going to fulfill all of our wildest dreams, that's just a recipe for suffering. So this sutra is sort of like, you probably shouldn't put all of your hope and dreams on impermanent elemental forms. Now, the, the simile is this idea of these vipers that are out to get you. <laughs> and maybe, again, maybe that's kind of a little strong in terms of like the early Buddhist form, but I wouldn't want to miss the message, which is about not getting too hopeful about the elemental world in that way. That the Buddhism would like to always remind you about impermanence and the way impermanence is gonna let you down. In other words, it's gonna, if you're, if you're, if you're clinging to that which is impermanent, I got bad news, I got bad news for you. That's the idea. So, Marnie, a follow-up? Yes, um, thank you so much for that. But so I think what you're saying basically is there's kind of this fear um, based mentality, or at least that's what I'm understanding with the early um, vehicle. But additionally, this leads into my next question that I had was, you know, when it talks about um, the empty village and it says, you know, a wise, competent, intelligent person examines them by with the way of the eye, you know, they're void, hollow, empty, but it doesn't explain to me them like, um, like this definitely needs more context, at least for me to understand it. And so I was hoping you can shine a little light on that. Um, is it especially for, for me to, to comprehend that? Yep. So the in that section about the empty village, it's referring to the eyeballs and the ears and the nose and the tongue. And those are what are to be viewed as hollow, void, and empty. 
the eyes are void and empty. The ears, the nose, the tongue, the body is void, hollow, and empty. Marnie, you're, at the beginning of your question, you mentioned sort of the, the fear. And I agree that the sutta that we've read, that we read tonight, and the kind of the message of tonight is, keeps talking about fear. Um, like run away, run away from the vipers, run away from the murderous uh, enemies and all of that. So I totally agree with you. I hear that. But in practice, not, not that this is any better, but in practice, the early form of Buddha, Buddhism, I would say, is not so fear-based as it is, um, what's the word? Well, I use the term a lot without really defining it, but rather than fear-based, the early Buddhist tradition, I find it's it's very kind of stoic, by which I mean kind of very um, austere, I would even call it masculine, I would even go so far as to call it machismo, a kind of real, like, um, like, being stronger than the world in that way. Like that was sort of, it, not about being afraid of the world so much as being like stronger and better than the world. And again, that has its own problems. Like that attitude or that weird relationship with the world is probably just as problematic, Marnie, as being afraid of the world. All the more reason though, to reiterate, you know, that idea that in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, it's much more about equality, equanimity across the board in that way. Like emotionally equanimous, ontologically, just all kinds of ways in that sense. So, yeah. All right, Noe, comment, question? Yeah, just real quick. Just real quick. You said it last time, Narvana, the Indian translation of the word nirvana nirvana to take off the heat to take away i just wanted to point that out that it's not on the other side but it's actually right here <laughs> excellent it's accessible excellent noe yeah and and by the way to noe your comment reminded me one last comment if you were to ask me as a kind of historian who studied like the history of all of these buddhist traditions it does seem to me that there was a time when these metaphors and similes were understood as similes and metaphors. And over time, Nirvana started to be over there. Even though I think the Buddha was always talking about what Noe was just talking about, that the, the, the quenching of the fire, the putting out of the flames, it's right here. But it's not here when the flames are burning in that way. So, yeah. And I, yeah, so I do think that the similes were taken to literally. And then in the Mahayana tradition, they pulled things back to the kind of original Dharma in that sense. So, all right, Noe, thank you for that. All right, everybody. Then I think, unless there's any last comments or questions. Then that's going to do it for this year's Dharma Doors. All right. Thank you all so much for coming, for being here. I love seeing you all on Sunday nights. So great. Uh, you, so, yeah. Michael. So, again, we're going to take a couple weeks off and we'll be back uh, in the first, I think that's probably what, January? January 7th. January 7th. So, Sunday, January 7th, we'll return. And I'll have plenty of time to put together some new uh, suttas for us all, or sutras. We don't know. We'll find out. So, Thank happy you. holidays! Excellent. Thank you. Happy holidays! Happy holidays, happy everybody! Holidays, I wish everybody. we all and lots of cheer. New year, new for everything. Cheers! Cheers! cheers. Thank cheers. you. Bye bye. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. Be well. <laughs>